In Chapter 1, we'll discuss decision-making. Specifically, we'll define decisions and decision-making, we'll consider decision-making components, and we'll look at decision-making steps and tools. A decision is a judgment or choice between two or more alternatives. This seems pretty obvious. You make decisions every day, whether to have a tuna sandwich or a hamburger for lunch, if you're going to enter the workforce or go to graduate school, which movie to see. In order to make a decision, you have to consider the available resources. And of course, when you have limited resources, you have some amount of uncertainty and risk. You've had the hamburger before, but that tuna sandwich looks awfully good. You want to enter the workforce, but if you can't find a job, you'll have to wait a whole semester before you can enroll in graduate school. In the media industry, or in any field for that matter, you as the manager have two tools for implementing decisions, time and money. How much time will it take to make the decision and subsequent change? And do you have the time necessary? And if you do have the time, do you have the money to make it happen? Money to pay for the necessary equipment, money to hire the necessary personnel, money to bring in consultants if necessary, time and money and understanding of how much you have and how much is needed. Both are critical in decision making. There are six components to decision making that must be considered. Number one, allocation or distribution. Who needs it most? And where is it most critical? Number two, again, resources can be scarce. If we had unlimited resources, no problem, but that is hardly ever the case. Number three, is it one or two individuals who will be making the decision, or is it a group? We'll discuss this in much more depth later on. Number four, what are our goals? If the goal is to maintain the status quo, decision making is often much easier than if we are looking to bring about a major change. Fifth, and once more, there is a level of uncertainty to any decision. We have to analyze that uncertainty and reduce it as much as possible in order to make a sound decision. And finally, risk. You have to consider the amount of resources that may be lost, the fact that no outcome of decisions are 100% certain, and you need to keep in mind the more important the decision, the more risk involved. There are two categories of decisions, programmed and non-programmed. Program decisions are those that are repeated on a regular basis. Newspapers and television stations produce content every day. It obviously is not the same stories or photos, but every day they produce news, weather, and sports. In order to determine which stories run with what artwork and in what position, managers and reporters have news meetings every day and often two or three times a day, all at the same time. When I worked in athletics, we had regularly scheduled sporting events, football on Saturdays, basketball on Wednesdays and Saturdays, volleyball on Tuesdays and Fridays, etc but each had different promotions and special events. We met every Monday at 1.30 to discuss the plans for the week. Non-program decisions are out of the norm. They don't happen every day. These can have consequences we are not used to. For example, if Walmart is found out to be out of compliance with ADA regulations, you need to report on this. But what if Walmart is by far your largest, largest advertiser? Reporting on its transgressions can have serious consequences on your advertising budget. Obviously, these kinds of decisions are fraught with risk and uncertainty. Decisions may also be proactive or reactive. Proactive decisions, as the name would suggest, are those that are made before the fact. In public relations, for example, when planning a campaign, we plan for any contingency that might occur so we may maintain a positive image. Reactive decisions happen after the fact, and unfortunately, sometimes in PR, we have to deal with these too. When BP had the oil spill in the Gulf, they had to react to a public backlash. They had to make decisions about how they were going to handle the blame and how they were going to try to regain public trust again. Obviously, the more proactive decisions you can make, the better. But naturally, this is not always possible. There are six steps with which you will have to become familiar in order to make sound decisions. First, you need to define the problem, or more specifically, be able to determine the difference between the problem and the symptoms. You may be losing ad revenue. That is a problem, yes, but it could be a symptom of reduced readership, which is the real problem. Next, you need to analyze the problem by collecting information. Why are you losing re readership? You may find it is because you have cut staff and therefore your coverage is suffering. People aren't getting the stories they want to read, so they are canceling their subscriptions. You also need to specify the goals of the decision to be made. Is the goal to get the ad revenue back, or is it to live with what you have? 
To specify the goals, you need to do step three. And that is de develop solutions. Think about alternatives. Let's assume your goal is to live with the revenue you have. Are you going to reduce pages or only print five days a week instead of seven? Or, if you decide you want to get those advertising dollars back, are you going to hire interns to demonstrate goodwill while increasing coverage? Or are you going to increase your social media presence in order to drive viewers and, re and readers to your website? Of course, in this process, you need to consider the cost-benefit ratio. Fourth, it's time to select the best solution by again analyzing the risk versus the gain, what will require the least effort, if you have the time to implement the necessary change, and how many resources are required. Now it's time to implement the solution. This is where communication is going to be critical. Your staff needs to understand the changes that are needed and they need to be on board. If you go with the solution of increasing the social media presence, your staffers are going to have to learn how to use the tools properly and they're going to have to accept that a little more work is coming their way. This, in my experience, can be the most difficult. We are all individuals with our own opinions and, in some cases, agendas. Therefore, getting all parties on board can be a serious challenge. You then need a detailed plan of action with steps to follow and plans for adapting to unforeseen circumstances. Obviously, you first are going to have to set up social media accounts for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all the other social media outlets. Next, you're going to need to have some training sessions, and then you're going to have to decide what is posted when and how. And finally, you need to monitor the solution. How much social media traffic are you sending out, and are you getting more readers? This is when you find out if the solution worked. Another way to make decisions is with a decision wheel. As you can see, this one rather comically looks like a dartboard. I don't recommend this approach. But a decision wheel laid out with options matched with necessary resources and potential outcomes can be useful as it provides a visual. A very useful decision making tool is a cost benefit analysis. The steps here are pretty self explanatory. Take a look at number four specifically. Developing a model or a matrix that shows the impact is extremely helpful. In our example, you might have a matrix that shows what could happen if we maintain the status quo, what could happen if we raise or lower ad rates, or the repercussions of upping the social media presence or of hiring more staff. Again, these kinds of visuals make seeing the end result easier. Not certain, but easier. Okay, we're halfway through this presentation, and now it's time to talk about another decision-making tool, the decision tree. These are useful for comparing alternate projects because they show probability percentages for each and they can be changed to fit the situation. This is an example of a decision tree based on online posting about the University of Notre Dame. You may need to enlarge it to read it fully. It gives the social media team at Notre Dame some direction. This is proactive decision making at its finest. In how to or whether to respond to posts and tweets on social media. Keep in mind that decisions may be made by individuals or by groups. Here you can see some of the pros and cons to each. On the next six slides, we'll cover different individual and group styles. Individuals may be satisficers or maximizers. Satisficers are fast acting, they consider whether the criteria are met at the minimum level, and then, when it is, they act and they worry about the results later. Maximizers, on the other hand, move more slowly. They collect all the information possible and analyze it before moving forward. The big question here is, which are you? It is critical to know this before it is time to make decisions so you have a better understanding of how you will react. Satisficers may be decisive and act after identifying one solution, or they may be flexible and may select more than one solution. Decisive satisficers don't waste time and tend to be more committed. But flexible satisficers are more adaptable and thus can adjust on the fly. Maximizers may be hierarchical or integrative. See how they are getting more and more deliberate? Hierarchical maximizers want the data. They want the details before they form a plan and focus on a solution. Take that a step further, and you have the integrative maximizers who get the data and consider several solutions before making any decisions. Both the hierarchical and integrative maximizers, ma maximizers follow a systemic two-step process to collect and analyze the data, prioritize the solutions, and select the best one. 
If you've ever been in a group, I'm sure you've seen how decisions are made. They may be made by default because nobody is doing anything. They may be self-authorized by those who step to the forefront, but are not supported by the group. Or they may be decided by a subgroup that seems to band together and force their will on others. Obviously, group decisions may be made by majority or consensus vote, and this decision is generally made beforehand, or an authority figure may emerge after group discussion, and that person has the final say. Finally, when evaluating the information, you need to consider whether the material is fact or opinion. If it is fact, it will have evidence to support it. If it is opinion, keep in mind that you may be very biased. Also follow the research steps. This is why in our undergraduate program we require a basic research methods course, and in our grad program we offer courses in quantitative and qualitative research. It is important to follow these key procedures in a systematic fashion. And it is also critical to know who created the information you are going to use. Are they authority figures? Did they follow a systematic procedure for gathering data? The data you use is only as good as those who provided it. Keep all of this in mind and you are well on your way to making good, sound decisions and as a result, being a competent media manager.